Obviously, our next speaker needs no introduction in this area as a legendary judge, a uh, longtime community leader, someone who's known for uh, being both a, a tough judge but also a, a sensible and compassionate judge who knows how to apply the law justly and fairly and also has concern for, for the, uh, the value of the lives that he's was uh, in, uh, impacting on the bench and now as a member of Congress and as a leader on a variety of issues and he was somebody who has the credibility to obviously look at this from the standpoint of the rule of law, uh, strong border security, and what are we doing. So without further ado, we'd like to hear from uh, Congressman Ted Poe. Thank you very much. Appreciate the chance to come by and talk to you all for a few minutes about some things that are important to all of us. Uh, yes, I'm Ted Poe. I'm a member of Congress. have been for uh, now my ninth year. Before that, I was served here in Houston as a prosecutor and then a judge uh, for a long time. And uh, I don't think any of you look familiar to me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's yours. Uh, but uh, thanks for inviting me by. When uh, you mentioned the word immigration, uh, people have, have an instant opinion. No matter who they are, they have an instant opinion. And uh, people have been talking about immigration reform since long before I ever went to Congress. And they've talked about it every year since I have been in Congress. And as my grandfather said, when all is said and done, more is said than done. And not much has happened, if anything, except the system has gotten worse. It's not gotten better. Current laws have not helped across the board. But it, it's kind of broken in a lot of different places. So we talk about immigration reform or fixing the problem. There are several problems that need fixing, as we say in Texas. <coughs> not one, but several. I think there are about eight. And my hope and desire is that we identify each problem and then solve each problem legislatively and then bring that legislation to the House floor all on one day and vote for uh, eight pieces of legislation. Why eight instead of one piece of legislation? You have several pieces of legislation brought up the same day on the same subject. Uh, you'll have members that will vote for some of them and against the others, but the idea that most of them will be able to pass is more likely than one big bill, which is easy to vote against no matter what the bill is. That just, I want to mention that to you politically. So I want to address the issues that are important to me, that I am personally working on. Uh, let's start with border protection. We have to redefine that issue about what that really means. I used to think that we had to solve, completely solve and fix the border before we dealt with other issues. There are several reasons why I've changed my mind. One reason is we need to deal with border protection, but we have to deal with the other issue, let's say temporary workers, because that will help fix the problem about border protection. Let me explain how in just a minute. So when we talk about border protection, who, here's who I'm talking about. I really am not talking about the people who are coming into the United States looking for work. I'm not talking about those folks. I'm talking about primarily the drug cartels. Uh, when we protect our border, it's a national security issue, and we have to protect our border from the criminal drug syndicate, the drug cartels. Chicago uh, has named in January, they named their public enemy number one. Their last public enemy number one that Chicago named, anybody know who that was? Oh. Al Capone. <laughs> you may have heard of him. Al Capone. They have named a new one. Public enemy number one is El Chapo Guzman. Who's he? He is the drug lord of the Sonola drug cartel. He doesn't live in the United States. He lives somewhere in Mexico or somewhere else. But they've named him public enemy number one because the public enemy number one in Chicago are those criminal drug cartels like the Sonola drug cartel that are bringing in not just guns, I mean not just drugs, but a lot of other things as well. Side note, they're now involved in human trafficking. 
Human trafficking is not bringing folks over here looking for work. Human trafficking is bringing young girls into the United States to sell them for sexual favors. And unfortunately, the greatest city in the world, Houston, Texas, is the hub of international trafficking into the United States. What does that mean? That means that because of our location, because the drug cartels operate south of the border, they get young girls into Mexico from all over the world, they ship them into Houston, Texas, and they farm them out throughout the country. So that's an issue of border security that we have to deal with. So we separate the two. So border protection, you know, people talk about it's safe, it's not safe. You've heard both. What's the truth? Well, it's safer in some places and it's worse in other places. I'll take you down to the Texas-Mexico border and I'll show you safe places. And then I'll take you to places that are horrible. Because every time we fix a spot, the drug cartels move somewhere else. They just, they just do that. <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't have all these problems about the drug cartels. So what we need to do, we need to do a, lot, do a lot more. One thing that we need to do, Henry Cuellar, a Democrat from Laredo, and I are working on trying to get our equipment that we have used in Afghanistan and Iraq that you paid for, it's coming back to the United States. Let's take it down to the border and let our border protectors use that to fight the drug cartels. As one Texas Ranger told me, the drug cartels outman us, outgun us, and outfinance us. But that's who I'm talking about when I talk about border protection. So fix that problem. And while we're doing that, we have to deal with uh, workers, and here's why. We want to encourage, let me explain it this way. When you have border patrol, flying a helicopter over the border, and they see a bunch of folks coming across the border. They don't know who those people are. They could be the migrants coming in here looking for work, or they could be the drug cartel folks bringing in drugs. They don't know until they actually stop them. We want them to be able to know that the people that they see sneaking across the border are the bad guys, the drug cartels, because we want those workers to go across bridges instead of across the brush. So we fixed that issue as well, and that helps border protection. I hope I was clear on that. So that's why I am focusing on temporary guest workers. We need to fix, we can work on that issue. It helps border protection. It then allows for our border patrol to actually deal with people that are coming over here to do bad things like drugs and trafficking of children. Uh, I used to believe that I did. I believe the philosophy that if, if there's an American out of work, they'll take any they'll take any job so that they're employed, especially those that are family. Well, that's just not true. It's not true. There's a lot of reasons it's not true. They don't take those jobs. Some of them. Why? They have other options. That's why. I'll give you an example. And I'm on the immigration subcommittee. I'm vice chairman. We had a hearing. And we brought in employers to help us see what the real world is like, not what we would want it to be like. And this guy is a, a peach farmer in Georgia. And he needed 2,000 peach pickers. I know that's not true, but what you call it. But <laughs> they pick peaches. You get the point. And so he did what he was supposed to do under the law. He, got, uh, he tried to get Americans to apply first. He gave them the first chance. And he needed 2,000. He had 496 Americans apply. He hired every one of them. Hired them all. Then he filled the rest with them. Right. Uh, after the first couple of weeks, from 496, he was down to about 60. And then at the end of the season, he had three that were working. Other options. That's an issue we have to deal with. Because we want people, you know, in the United States who are citizens to, to work. But that's an issue we have to deal with. But the real world is, this guy needed somebody to pick those peaches. You can't just sit around because the peaches kind of get old. Yeah. So, you know, and, and that's a constant problem among not just the agricultural community, but it's, it's in the roofing business, construction business. It's in the restaurant business. It's in several businesses that they need more help because they can't get Americans to pay for the jobs. <laughs> then on the other end, we have high-tech folks that can't, uh, companies can't get high-tech engineers and people that work with computers a lot. You know, some of y'all are those kind of people. I'm not one of those guys who know much about computers. You know, I've just learned email. So, uh, that's all that other stuff. Um, 
And you got our employers, you know, they're working with some universities and they're giving scholarships and all of that to American citizens who are doing what they can. But the bottom line is they can't get enough people in the high tech industry. See, that happens to deal with not just jobs, but the economy is affected when you can't get your peaches to market and when you can't get your product made. You know, <coughs> that affects our economy. And so we have people coming over here on visas. They stay over for a while because we let them stay. And then after six years, they go home to wherever they came from and they compete against the United States. They don't want to go home. They want to stay here. Many of them don't even want to be citizens. They just want to be permanent residents. They want to stay in the United States and work and pay taxes. But the system sends them back home. They compete against us. We want the next Google invention in the United States. We don't want it in some foreign country, you know. Especially if we educated them and, you know, for six years and they worked here. So, we need workers on both ends of the scale. Now, the issue has come up, well, how many do we need? Well, we need as many as we need. That's how many we need. I don't know the number. I can't tell you the number. I think an arbitrary number that has been set by different groups, special interest groups, that's an arbitrary number. And those numbers that they talk about in the Senate, they can be filled in the first month of a year. And so what was will that do? We passed the Senate bill. The numbers in the Senate bill aren't sufficient because as soon as the first month or so is over, on both ends, we're in the same system we're in right now. We have the shadow economy going on. So uh, I think it ought to be market-based driven. We need as many as we need. Sure, there has to be a cap somewhere. I don't know where that is, but the philosophy has to be market-based so that we get as many as we need on both levels. Those temporary guest workers uh, that do the, the hard labor work and then those temporary guest workers or the temporary students and workers on the high end, I don't, we need that to be market-based. So that's, that's what I believe in and I think that's the system we have to move forward to deal with. Um, in the House, we haven't come up with a solution. There's been a working group that's been going on now really about four years. Uh, they have not come up with a solution on some of the seven or eight different points. Uh, what I suspect will happen, and I hope does happen, and I'm on the Judiciary Committee, and we will have all of these issues continue to be vetted out in our committees. Uh, what does that mean? Well, we'll bring witnesses in to testify. And the more we learn, the better we can draw draft legislation. We have legislation that's drafted, then you can debate it, amend it, subtract it in both the committee process and then on the House floor. And then sometime, I suspect, really later this year, maybe even the first of next year, to get the legislation. Now, there's been a rush since numerous years, but we're not going to, I don't think we should rush through it in the name of getting something done if something is wrong about the bill. So, the bills. Why several bills? Several bills have a better chance of being passed than just one big, a massive piece of legislation. Uh, I am one who thinks that we should have a, a simple biometric card for, for all immigrants. The law already requires identification if you're an immigrant. But rather than having so many different systems, have one system that works. So when a person comes in the United States, States across the border, they slide and glide, so as I call it. They slide in the United States like you do at Walmart, and then the photograph, biometrics, tell us everything that we need to know about that person, where they're going to work, how long we're going to be there, and if they get near their six month stay, that there is interior enforcement, that's part of border protection, to make sure that that person either re-ups their visa or that they go back home. We don't have basically interior enforcement in the United States. 60% uh, of the people, but some say 60% of the people who came to the United States legally uh, never went home. There was no interior enforcement. And why would anybody go home? I mean, if, especially if they're in Texas. Why would they leave in Texas? I mean, really, why would you leave? Paradise. So uh, we need interior enforcement, but a, a uniform biometric card is a way that I think we can deal with that. Uh, and then we have an entry and exit system that works the same way on the people, whether they're coming over here to, to visit, whether they're coming over here to go to school, whether they're coming over here to work. We all, they all have the same type of system. My office, we have an office on Post Oak, right across the street over here. And we have one in Kingwood. And we deal on immigration issues more than we do any other issue except maybe with the military. Trying to help people get into the United States legally. And the system is just broken across the board. Uh, we've had people come over here for, you know, as the movie was, the, the, the Greek wedding concept. They were coming over here for a wedding. 
Mama couldn't get here from Athens. Ooh, she was mad, you know. And we had to help her get in the, she's not a terrorist. She didn't come, want to come over here, overstay her visa. She didn't want to go back to Athens. Just to get her in the United States was a complicated mess, see? Because that system is, needs fixing too. You know, whether you're a guest worker, whether you're a temporary resident, whether you want to come to the United States to go to a wedding, whether you're coming over here to a, a, a conference. You know, we've had the horror stories here in Houston. We've had people from all over the world come to, want to come to our medical center for a conference. They can't get in. They don't want to stay here. They want to go back where they came from. But just that red tape. And I'm not, I'm not complaining about anybody in the border, you know, ice. I'm not complaining about them. They're just following what the law requires. We need to make it simpler and more efficient and happier. So temporary guest workers, workers on the high level is, uh, are workers that we need to solve that problem. What will that do? That will help solve the border security issue as well. And meanwhile, let's deal with the, the real criminals who are uh, the drug cartels and their endeavors. There are other issues, uh, as you all know, and uh, I would like your suggestions on how we can fix all of these. So I will yield back my time, and uh, we'll, go, we'll go from there. Thank you very much for allowing me to come back.